TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are live. By the time you see this, we won't be. So just leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family from Chicago to the UK and all around the world. I guess. Uh, don't forget, we do have Patreon where we post five days a week stuff we can't watch on YouTube. Game of Thrones really got us in a chokehold, so come join us if you feel like it. If not, that's cool, man. Just be on Twitch with us. Twitch.com. Use your names at the bottom of the screen. Uh, this is Down the Rabbit Holes channel. This is called Maximum Security. Inside Walpool State Prison. I don't know where that is. Never even heard of it. That sounds like Idaho or something. Like, what the hell is Walpole? Walpole? What is that, Kentucky? Anyway, talk to me. Oh, yeah, there's the warning, YouTube. I don't know what's going on on here. So. Copyright disclaimer under Section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. Allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. True. Talk to me. In Massachusetts, Walpole State Prison. Massachusetts. So I know people butts getting taken. Just saying. This prison now. Pause. Prison is the end of the line. It houses 700 of the state's most violent, unmanageable offenders. 300 corrections officers come to work here every day. Their job is to impose order onto an environment that constantly threatens to spin out of control. This security checkpoint is the only way in or out. Since it was opened in 1956, no one has ever escaped from Walpole. Okay, two cameras. You guys are carrying. Do you know that aluminum foil is contraband? Thank you. And I'm going to stamp your inner right wrist just in case you guys get lost in there. I don't think you want to spend the night, right? What do they make out of aluminum foil? Well, I don't even want to get lost. They what do you mean? Bombs out of there. They use matches. Anything with a spark on that's it's not allowed in the institution. How do you make a bomb out of aluminum foil? Mm -hmm. If you have 24 hours in your cell, you can think of a lot of ways. You have some smart inmates in here. We can come to work one morning and not go home. Um, and certainly that, that plays... Lieutenant Robert McGinnis, Chief Security Officer. Heavily on your mind sometimes. We've had people quit the first day that they come in. Some people, it takes them a little bit longer, but you know within a short period of time whether this is for you or not. I ain't gonna lie, during the application, I'll quit. <laughs> or I'll be applying. They don't even got the job yet and be done. You know what I'm saying? We came here to follow an 11-member team known officially as the Inter-Perimeter Security Unit, or IPS. They are the police in a world composed entirely of the state's most hardened criminals. Same thing. Okay, just about there. What gets you into Walpole is repetitive misbehavior at other institutions. We have inmates serving sentences in here ranging from um, drug convictions to multiple homicides, um, and it runs the entire gamut. Um, it's not just based on your crime. The majority of it is based on your behavior. So everybody in here, tough as hell. It's the worst of the worst prisoners. When you acting up at your original prison, all right, you going here. Within hours, one gang member has slashed another. The IP security unit has recovered the weapon, a handmade steel shank. 
Yeah, okay, just hang on. I want something was tampered with. Down. That might be it. Two screws. It looks a little long line? for the clamp. Uh, the One side spoon is rounded. He may have cut that. Yeah, it is cut on the end. Last year alone, 98 inmates were seriously assaulted at Walpole, That's and 260 weapons were yep. found. Yep. Where are they getting that from, Jimmy? Javino Rivera cell. If this is the way society wants to run their prisons in an orderly fashion, we have to investigate crimes within the prison. We're not going to call the local police to come in here and do that. It's our jurisdiction. It's our responsibility to do that. Your metal comes down, Flashing. And, it, and it folds right back up again on the other side. I'm pulling that off, snapping it off. The front still looks the same, but the back edge is gone. Yeah, we'll have to check those. My brain is mangled. This is a, this is a through the process of interrogation, the security unit hopes to gain information about other homemade weapons hidden within the cell block. Hey, if he kicks something in later on, we can do something for him. Yep. Maybe. Yep. No guarantees, though, naturally, but... Yeah, he says he's all done because okay. informational purposes, his information line's done. Okay. Because if he goes back now, he's a hero, you know what I'm saying? Now I think the next one may be shaking the whole block. That's, I'm waiting for that one next. <laughs> you know it's coming. Yeah. You know, it's coming. That's all right, but we gotta, we gotta be able to, uh, I don't know, we gotta be able to go in there and take our time. Really take our time. Right. And just go through every little, every little thing that's in there. That's right. The interrogation proves successful, and Lieutenant Grassi orders a surprise shakedown of the cell block known as Plymouth 2. Kenny, what's your 20 right now? Just give him your name. 45, 44, 43. Let's go. All right. All set. Ready? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go, go, go. All right. the block. These guys in. I know, man. The fact that the first thing that happened on this documentary is a, is a, is a, is a shank, attempted shanking is a little bit, you know what I'm saying? It's a bit wild, man. Alex, I hear all these toilets flushing. Does that mean anything? Yeah, they're probably flushing things they're not supposed to have in their cells. Uh, the paperwork, maybe even weapons. So. Shakedowns are a logistical nightmare. The goal is to empty all 45 cells while keeping gang members from attacking one another. We've got to be real careful in this block because there's five sectors and you got to really be careful of who you let out with who. There's five sectors of uh, nine inmates each. Those nine are compatible with each other. And if we kind of intermingle sectors, we're asking for troubles. Be cognizant of who's out with who. We're going to try to stay within the sectors. Okay, Andy, what we're looking for also are those uh, hard toothbrushes, the oral bees. They are, you know what they Yeah, man, but it's hard to do, like, all nine sectors or whatever, however many sectors separately, right? Because the point is, once you walk in, they can see you. So if you do one at a time, the last sector, you're never going to find anything, ever. They look like, yeah. take those. Take those. Yeah, okay. take them. This line of business is kind of uh, paramilitary. I like to look at it as paramilitary as opposed to uh, being like a police department. My father was in the service, so uh, I'm an army brat. So I think that brought me a long way because he was kind of a squared away person. He liked to have his uniform squared away and his boots shined. So you, you learn you learn from that. I've been having a problem with these eyeglasses because they're inside these uh, earpieces, if that's what they are. There's a sharp metal thing that's already sharpened to a point, and these guys have been stripping off the plastic and using these as weapons. Let's go see what this guy's up to. Yeah, stand over in the slop sink. Why? Because you can't be with these dudes. Right in the slop sink. All right. What's up with these? These inmates try to be intimidating. Where's the other part? So uh, you kind of call their bluff. You have to know when they're not bluffing, of course. But you have to meet force with force, and, and uh, we will always come out the victor. You got a prescription for these? I use them just for fun. No, no. Yeah? yeah. Around, huh? Yeah, okay. We'll be checking that out. I take, I don't give. The guys in the second tier, if you notice, I've been constantly looking up at them. If they start going astray or if they're doing something silly, I'm going to be right on it. Keo Van or Van Keo. See if he's supposed to have some glasses because uh, we're missing Oh, we're definitely those. removing those. Where's the two ends? He don't know. He threw them in the trash. He's not going to be able to get a new pair. That's correct. He says he needs them for right. round, not even reading. Little retrieving line here, hey, fellas. Danny! What is that? 
It's a retrieving line. Uh, what does that mean? When they're okay. locked in, they can, kind of, uh, kind they can put a weight on the end of it and send things around to anybody on the block. You know, they throw it over the tier, and <coughs> the next guy will pass it down. Efficient. It's a way of getting things around to the in the block. I'm going to tell you, mate. Yeah, I want to check this toothbrush out because it looks like it may be one of the ones we're looking for. He's got this wrapped around pretty good hey, here. excuse me. No, there was another question I had, too. Van Keo, K-E-O. Can we check and see if he's got a current prescription on eyeglasses? Hmm. Oh, Stinger. This is a heating device. Oh, what they do is they uh, plug this into the wall socket, and it's two pieces of metal. Usually, a, as you can see, it's an old nail clipper. As long as you keep them separated by a piece of cardboard or a piece of plastic, you can plug this into the wall, and this will start heating up cherry red hot. They put it, they put it in a cup of water. On the water to boil it. See, the, the tough part about that is... Yeah, it, man, uh, a lot of these hardcore prisons out in America, you don't even get no kettle. I always thought y'all like in the UK them getting the kettle was crazy, but it's an obvious weapon. But you know, it. If it gets wicked hot, like you would have it, you know, on, on top of your stove, and throw it at the staff. Got your stinger. Last year, 24 officers, or nearly 10 percent of the workforce, <coughs> were violently assaulted by inmates, often during routine operations like this. Somebody's got to watch your back. I mean, you can't be doing it. You got your eye in that camera right there. Some of these guys, I'm telling you, you know, you, you turn your back and you get lax and you're walking the tears. Someone can reach out and do something silly to you. Even if it's not life-threatening, you still don't want to be disrespected like that. So. You got to watch that camera guy, man. He's going to get jumped. Huh? He's going to get stabbed. Watch Who's that? The camera guy. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. I would have instantly wouldn't have put a stab-proof vest on. You couldn't have told me that. Right right when I'm right here? Camera man trying to act like he ain't here. Close one nine. Man. Surveillance. This is the surveillance chapter. Alright, this is up. Nine block. Lucio. Cox. Cahill, Diver, Juan, Fernandez. Yeah. Mayor Los You know what's crazy? How many of these cops, these 300 cops, or not even cops, COs in here, <coughs> out of the 300, how many of y'all think is um, corrupt? I would, I would say at least 5% of them. To you. And that's being nice. This morning, the security unit is trying to head off a racial conflict. Left unchecked, this is the sort of activity that can set off riots. Sergeant Steve Kennedy and Alex Rodriguez are assigned to a surveillance operation to monitor the inmates. From an observation gallery, Alex serves as the eyes watching the inmates through one-way mirrored glass. We picked up some information yesterday that a uh, possible racial uh, problem was happening yesterday. There was a large number of blacks and a large number of whites. Had a discussion um, from there. Yeah, but if y'all don't know, prison is broken up into race, racial, race, race in America. So when you go to prison, not jail, real prison, like, and this is outside of Maybe even California. I can't speak on California. California is a different breed altogether. You know what I'm saying? So let me speak about the other stuff, man. Normally when you get to prisons, you got to stick with your race. No matter your gang affiliation. Yes, you can still be affiliated with your gang. But when it comes time to, to ride, you got to be with your race. Dispersed. And what we're doing today in is this just prison. keeping an eye on what we call like the heavies. Um, prison life. Guys who pretty much have a lot, a lot of word or say in the block. He's trying to um, get a racial thing going between the whites and the blacks. He, he, um, is he white or black? Yeah, he's a white guy. He's one of the, he's an older white guy, maybe in his mid-40s, trying to get these younger kids up and coming to join him. 
Walpole is an outdated, maze-like facility, but the IPS security unit has managed to turn the ventilation shafts and inner corridors into hidden listening posts. They're aware that we do come down here and monitor them, but if, if they hear our radio going or if they hear us creak on, a, on, a, on one of the grates, what they'll do is they'll yell IPS behind the block, so that way it warns the other inmates in the unit that we're back there. But as long as we're quiet, they should have no indications that we're back there. Well, you're not quiet, yeah, buddy. They yeah. slick, though. The window right there is not a one-way mirror. They can see you. Well, this is slick. The second floor now. I feel like they're trying to be quiet and every time you try to be quiet no matter if it's in your house in in, in school and anywhere it get louder 33 yeah not quiet did you copy that yeah I'm in right now but I can't make it out I've never seen this done ever I don't even know what year this is from this is some slick ass stuff though, right here. Yeah, did you get anything out of that? And Paul, what cell do you have in them? The whole crew is in cell 34. And, but they're in front of the cell, so I don't know what you can pick up. They can see you out of Back there, you wouldn't believe what you heard. <laughs> you have one guy come over to another guy, hey, hey John, I'm looking to get a weapon, you know, what do you got? Well, I know a guy who's got a 12-inch a piece of steel, I know another guy who's got a pick. Oh, okay, all right, great, what do you want for it? Talking about what the, who's making the homebrew tonight and uh, what time they're gonna, what, what time they're gonna get together and split it up. Whoa, you all right? Walpole will always be Walpole. gonna get together and split it up whoa you all right the cameraman ran into a pole that's funny you gotta be aware of your surroundings big brother walpole will always be walpole that's the same cameraman that got threatened earlier that's why he nervous running in the poles they're stuck with us and we're stuck with them until further notice anyway Alex Rodriguez has particular first-hand knowledge about gangs from having been raised in the inner city. There are so many gang members here, they're kept isolated in four designated cell blocks to prevent them from gaining new recruits. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna straighten that up. Prison gangs are highly organized, making them the biggest threat to security. The mere presence of our cameras seems to have set them off. Yeah, okay. so I'm yeah, no, 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 nobody's face is going to be on. I know that's not the point, though. You know what I'm saying? That's it's not up to me. I just follow oh, orders, man. We're going to get them out of here. What's going on? What's going on? Yeah, they're not happy. So they'll probably be better off to um, do it from outside. Okay. No, they didn't want us in there. Uh, basically. <laughs> basically, uh, they're just giving us a heads up, you know. Hopefully we have that respect, we can relate with each other. Oh, so they were serious. Buddy was serious when he told that cameraman he was gonna get shanked. They moving like that in this prison? The prison guards is actually listening? <laughs> like, all right, cut, settle down. Let's, let's bring you out here for your safety. I can't protect you. This is my job, but I can't protect you in here, really. Be no biggie, though. And who would they, uh... Who would they most be angry at? Me. Why? Because I'm the gang officer and I should have known better. And that's how they play it. Dealing with gangs involves unique... So you in there trying to be cool and, oh, this is a camera. Nah, buddy. Risks. 
their power can extend far beyond the prison walls. About a year and a half ago, uh, I had an incident where a number of guys showed up in front of my house, uh, threatened me, um, basically told me to stop doing what I'm doing. But um, no, you know, nothing assaultive, no physical action occurred. They walked away, I walked away. Um, so it was, you know, it was a big thing. Sometimes you gotta be very careful on how you, you relate with these guys. They tracked you down? How did they find where you lived? This ain't even a job for me anyway. I would never, in this in police officing, I would never do. But like, the fact that they tracking down correctional officers, and do I even believe you? You still working here? You putting your whole family at risk after that type of incident? Man, listen. If they need, want to find out where you live, they have no problem doing it. Threats from inmates come in many forms. This afternoon, the security unit has intercepted an intimidating letter to a state prosecutor. We wrote a letter to the district attorney's office, the state police call. It's a real nice letter. Um, Dear Mr. O'Reilly. Let's get negative. Parentheses, Mr. Dead Man. I hope that when you get this letter that you're fucking dead. I'm going to have my people put a bomb in your car. I'll also have a bomb in your house and yours. Um, how's your wife doing? I'm sure you don't want anything to happen to her. And it also says, P.S. Get back to me, motherfucker. Because um, you'll die real soon. So count your blessings. I know he couldn't have really expected that letter to get all the way to its destination. And now what do they do? They got to go send a warning or something. Kenny, I'd like you to take a look at this here. Sure. Death threats and what have you. Okay. We need somebody to go down and take him out and uh, have a word with him. Okay. On the streets, you have a, a situation with the uh, Middlesex uh, attorney's <laughs> office? Yeah, yeah, I got a problem with them. Did you Big write problem. them any letters? Yeah, I wrote them letters. Recently? Uh, about two weeks ago or something like that. You're going to have to start seeking some better avenues than this. You send out things to these people in these high places. <laughs> it's going to come back and haunt you, buddy. And you just came out of a situation over the weekend where you got involved with the officer down there doing, doing the same damn thing. Yeah, no, he threatened an officer yesterday, too? He uh, threw juice in the officer's face and did threaten his him with bodily harm and yeah. death. You're not going to go too far like that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Now, uh, whatever you're doing time for, you, what are you doing time for? For manslaughter, for um, uh, supposedly killing my uncle. <clears throat> and, you know, I got a deep problem. And, you know, I got like a personality problem. One minute I be a thugster, next minute I be a cry little, you know, a sh shy little baby type person. Okay. Sounds like you need to be a broad, more psychiatric. It got you somewhere that you should not be. I can't think of anything else. Can you, uh, Officer Rivera? Dave, we're all set. Thank you. I've been here 16 years, and everybody in here is uh, a bad guy. Yeah. An inmate, yeah, get under your skin. If they know more about you than what, what meets the eye here at your workplace, they're going to utilize that to their advantage, sure. No question about that. I have, like, it, it, surp it still surprises me that these people that work in, in prisons don't use aliases. Like, why would I put my real last name on a pendant? You know what I'm saying? Or or first name. Like, you know what I'm saying? Not doing it. It's just not happening. We hear stories that um, inmates, you know, spit in the food. We hear stories they uh, squirted semen in the food. Anything, you know, something falls on the floor, they put it back in. Well, the worst possible thing you can think someone can do to food, they've probably done it. So that's why a lot of, you see a lot of the old times will never, never touch it. They'll bring their own food. But, um, I eat it. <laughs> you know? After saying all that, you must say pause after. You said they put man of C in there. And then he going, I eat it. <laughs> Bro. You basically eating meat. Mm -hmm. 
Here's my question. Great. Is Charlie banging because he wants to go to the yard? Charlie's banging because he's exactly sir. Are right, you tell Charlie that you're in charge of the tier. Right. And that he'll get his recreation. However, he does not dictate to you when he goes to the yard. He'll be allowed to go to the yard when you decide he's to go out. All right, sir. Charlie Chase is considered the most violent and unmanageable inmate at Walpole. Originally convicted of armed robbery and murder, he has racked up a record 132 disciplinary offenses behind bars, earning him the longest sentence ever in that's, the DDU. That's, what's the sentence? Get him down! Get him! Um, as far as Charlie's concerned, he's stripped all the time. His cell is shaken down because he's a major um, escape risk as well as a threat to the security of the institution. He's caught all the time with makeshift contraband. He's caught with weapons. Okay. He's got a swastika painted right here, Steve. He's got, he's got one on his trap door, too. He's very disruptive down here. I don't think there's been one consistent month that he's behaved himself, so his time down here isn't counting and that goes on a month-to-month -month basis. Do you think he's crazy? Crazy? Tries to come off like that, but theoretically, I don't think he's crazy, no. Given his often bizarre behavior, Charlie's lawyers question whether... At this point, might be. Solitary confinement is, in fact, driving him insane. It probably Along is. Along with 10 other DDU inmates, Charlie is named in a class action lawsuit claiming that the DDU employs cruel and unusual punishment. All this that you're witnessing is a conspiracy to keep a good man down. That's all it is. Well, Charlie, I've seen a swastika on the back of your door. Can't be that great of a guy. You know what I'm saying? He's a clown. Yeah. Say it to his face. No, it's not the right opinion, but he is. How long have you been in here, Charlie? How long I've been here? Yeah. Uh, six years this this year. When are you getting out? I don't know. I got another nine years left. Yeah, they took a lot of good time from me, you know? Like I said earlier, it's, it's like a conspiracy to set me up to leave me here, you know what I mean? Okay. Thank you, Charlie. We've had our problems down here. A lot of it's... Uh been with forced moves in the cells, or, uh, inmates refusing to come out of their cells, refusing to exit their cells, so a team would be put together or a protective gear and we'd try to get him out. Some DDU inmates are considered so dangerous that it can require as live as footage. six officers in full body armor to extract them from their cells. Did an officer just trip? Go, go, go. Go, go, go. <laughs> he tripped. This dude tripped. I've seen it. This is this is 30 this years ago. This move involves inmate Charlie Chase. For legal reasons, such incidents are always videotaped by prison officials. You accept that if you violate rules and regulations that you're going to be punished. But then there's a fine line between what's punishment and what's torture. You know, a guy that's behaving in, a, in a, uh, an odd manner because of being psychologically unbalanced is a lot different than what I knowingly did. I escaped. I mean, I knowingly knew what I was doing. But an inmate that's uh, having a psychotic episode and as a consequence of that behavior is put into DDU, something's very wrong with that. You know, that I have a problem dealing with. I go home tomorrow morning. What are you wrapping up? What's it been like for you? Luis Vega. If we put microwaves and uh and refrigerators and washing and dryers in their cells, they find something else to complain about. And, I mean, you can see their living conditions are not that bad. Uh, no, nah, it's bad. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, but what you seeing.
Some of the most dangerous inmates here show serious symptoms of mental illness. Hands right, your mouth. And for the security unit, dealing with these individuals can be intensely frustrating. Well, this inmate sent a letter to one of the mental health workers. He's been sending letters to everybody. So I'm just going to go through it and see what we've got here. A lot of it is just nonsense stuff. Aggravation type things. And there's a nice little package of something here. I have no clue what it is. I'm starting to get an aroma of it now, and it smells like human regurgitation. You know how many letters I've gone through of yours? Alexander Perkins II. Over the last couple of months with, with feces in them and everything else in them. I mean, I don't really want to open it up because the letter stinks. And I'll probably stink up this whole room when I unseal this bag. So what, uh, did, did you, was a handwriting analysis expert, you know, hired to detect that that was my handwriting? It's, not, mean, it's not needed. So you saying that there's no possible way that another inmate could have afforded that, you know? No, I'm just asking you if you wrote it. I'm not, I'm not here to, to critique the, uh, the contents of the letter. I don't think there's a need to send it to a lab or to have it analyzed. I'm asking you, did you write the letter? Makes you feel like you want to do something to the guy to make it permanently stop, you know? But why would he say yes? Deal with it uh, directly in different ways, but it get permanently stop. Need to send it to a lab or to have it analyzed. What did this officer just say? I'm asking you, did you write the letter? Makes you feel like you want to do something to the guy to make it permanently stop. You see what I'm saying? Remember I said 5% is the number slowly trending up. <laughs> you know, deal with it uh, directly in different ways, but it, it makes you feel pretty disgusted. Do we have to screen every single piece of mail that you generate? Does it, ha does it have to come to that? I, I hope it doesn't. It's just, it'd just be tedious for me, you know what I mean? I don't feel like checking your mail every single day. I have no comment. Well, it's about the end of this. Come on. This individual also uh, threw a nice big cup full of human feces on the clergyman as the clergyman was standing by his cell trying to help him out. The inmate proceeded to stab him in his arm and then throw a big fluffernutter container full of human excrement all over the clergyman. And that, my friend, <laughs> should have been that clergyman's last day. You know what I'm saying? Last day, uh, he probably don't work there no more. He got hit with a Glock, with a with a Dookie shotgun, and then got yeah. I'm, mm -mm. We're done. We'll deal with it. We'll deal with it. In fact, for that last escapade with the uh, religious person, uh, I think that's going to get him some DDU time. In the main section of Walpole Prison, a major disturbance has broken out in one of the cell blocks. We're what denied now? permission to film during the incident and are only now allowed briefly to see its aftermath. I'm going to go down with the lieutenant. We're going to just make a round in the unit, see how things are going, take a peek in the cells, pull on the door. Just to get a general feel for what's going on. When you're doing something like that, maybe a corner tool will stop you and they'll, they'll let you know what's up, give you a little feedback as to what's going on in that unit. How'd you end up in this thing? <laughs> I see you come up from breakfast, right? Yeah, how do you get caught up in that stuff? This occurred because the inmates that were put in here were previously in a, a regular population block. They, they had yard privileges, they had uh, chow hall privileges. And I guess it's their way of protesting and being returned to higher custody. We'll just go well, ahead and for monitor. Us, ain't it? Um, we'll hey, free guys, but I'm saying. The ringleaders have to come out. They'll be taken out and be brought to say. So we'll, uh, we'll wait for the word from the top. How well, often does this kind of thing happen? Not very often anymore. Not very often anymore. Later, Lieutenant Robert McGinnis shows some of the younger officers a videotape of what Walpole used to be like. This was March 6, 1981. It was a very long day. It started at uh, 7 o'clock in the morning with what we were going to consider routine moves to segregation. Uh, 
of, I think, five or six inmates. I was at cell 15 down the end. And, and I believe it was an inmate on the third tier that was refusing to come out. You ever seen this tape? No, I have never seen this tape. Yeah. They're going in his cell. He's fighting. How did they do this? How did this happen? Would they had a ladder? It's trashed in here. He's actually stabbed. The captain. You can see the blood. Where were you while this is going on? I'm one of those four or so officers that were down there. Yeah, I was at the other end of the tier. We've gone down. And what happens at this point is the attack members up in the gallery are introducing gas into the unit. At this point, we've introduced some officers with shotguns. Has he got a gas gun? No, shotgun. And I just think it was the the strong will of the department to to run its facilities and not allow inmates to run its facilities. And I, I think that concept holds true today that, you know, we run the institutions, not the inmates. Mm. Mm. That's why things like this happen in there. I feel like on all good prisons, you gotta, like, give the prisoners, like, some type of fault, at least. At least a thought that they run it. Mm. They always say people in law enforcement have the highest divorce rate and this and that. And um, it always seems to be that they let the, let themselves get stressed out, you know. They take everything in or they, you know, being around inmates all the time. They're not here because they're the nicest people in, uh, in society, you know. <laughs> and uh, prison life in general is depressing, you know. How long are you in here for? Prison for 27 years. What'd you do? Second degree murder. Not too long ago, there was an inmate murdered in here. Um, as in other places of the prison. When you think, uh, you know, it's not a dangerous place because you look around and you see, well, everyone's working. This particular incident happened first thing in the morning. Uh, they arrived to work. And uh, by the end of the day, I mean, one was dead. So that's the kind of things that transpire. Right in this area here. One of those things. Yeah, I'm gonna show us it. Staff members over the years that have turned into alcoholics as a result of this job. Um, we've had people commit suicide. Sue And I really think a lot of it is because they don't do something to relieve their stress outside of work. They should quit. If you're going through it that and that deep, just quit. What happens here? That alarm is always in the back of your head. When's it going to go off? Uh, what do I do if the alarm goes off? What's my job? If everybody does their little job, then we should be okay. It could be anywhere from a homicide to s just uh, one inmate yelling at the officer, or punching another inmate that the officer felt it the need to freeze the place up. The stress level is always there. Yes, that's probably why our life expectancy is an average of 55 years. 55. Hey Siri, what's the average life expectancy for a male? Male, 76.1 years. Average life expectancy of a U.S. male at birth. It's not bad. You know what, I'll take that. That ain't bad. 76? Dang, I mean, I got, <laughs> I got a long time left. Forty plus years, like it's not that long. Today at Walpole State Prison, inmate Louis Vega is going home. In just thirty minutes, he will leave solitary confinement in the DDU, be given a fifty-dollar check, and go directly back into society. No rehabilitation or nothing. He ain't did nothing about it himself. How long has it been, Lewis? How long has it been? Five years, some months. How's it feel now? It was good, you know. 
this that's how it should feel, you know? After leaving these walls. I think that when an inmate finishes his sentence and commits some sort of heinous crime within a short period of time, Puerto Rican. there's a hue and cry that, well, he never should have been released. Well, he had to have been released. He finished his sentence. And, you know, do we rehabilitate people? People want to have to change themselves. Not here, you know. And even if people do want to change themselves, it doesn't seem like this prison is that. <laughs> Most of the people that we see in our system are just career criminals and doing time is just part of that business. It's a temporary setback. I can't say I'm never coming back because where I come from, you know, it ain't on um, cookies and milk. So, and I'm going back home, back to the same place. I'm not gonna deny where I'm from and I ain't gonna run from it either. Hey. Where are you from? I will let me be up. They're seeing you and they're, they're looking at you the way you, you know, conduct yourself. And they may try to emulate that. They may try to resent that, uh, your authority figure. Believe it or not, you know, it's like with anyone you meet or anything you do, you, you leave there, something you behind no matter where you go or what you do. You leave something behind with somebody. I believe that, you know. Maybe you can leave a little something good that when they do get back out into society, you know, maybe, you, maybe you've done a little good. Not too often that you feel like you've, been, you've done some good. I think he's from New York. He sound like he got a New York accent. I'm not gonna stay here till I'm growing old. You know, Cap, you probably still there right now. You know what I mean? You're surrounded by concrete and bars and all you're hearing all day is slamming doors and metal hitting metal you know i mean it, it gets to you you know i've seen some people retire and two months down the road drop dead of a heart attack it's all thrown away you know and that's not what i want to do your plans when you get out of here in 20 years oh 20 years I couldn't even tell you. Um, I'm hoping that I can have my kids in school. You know, that's pretty much how I'm thinking of them instead of me. As long as I'm living and happy, I'm all set, <laughs> pretty much. I mean, this, this is our seniority know. list. But when you start make, when you make it to the front page, it's big of the seniority list. Right now, well, Kenny's on the, Kenny and Johnny are, are on the second, second page, page, and I'm at. Seems like y'all done here. <laughs> well, I might have snuck. Talking about seniority and things of that nature. Into the se second page. After that. These guys up at the top, boy, they're sitting pretty. <laughs> no one wishes. Just no leave, you know, it's, they're all done. We yeah. have nice train of thought. You can show off this front page. I'll still be here. Nice train of thought. Will you, though? You eating prison prepared meals? You might not. Tell them leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post. Uh, can I leave like 100 likes, please? That's light. Thank you.